Hello and welcome. This is going to be our lecture video for the Unit 8 test review. Let's go ahead and get started with this graph here. We need to label it uh, with a bunch of things. So let's just go one at a time. Where is this graph solid? It's going to be the lowest temperature where it's still changing in temperature. Uh, the solid liquid mix will be next. It, flat lines because all of the added heat is going into changing the, the phase. Uh, and it is a solid liquid mix, kind of like a slush. Um, after it all melts, it's liquid, and then the temperature is able to change. We can heat liquids up. And then in the next section, it's going to be a liquid mixed with a gas. So it is, it is boiling in this phase here. It says mix. And all the temperature is going into um, turning the liquid molecules into gas molecules. So the temperature uh, of everything stays the same. And then in uh, this last section, it doesn't say, but this here, here we are vapor. Uh, where is the melting point? So here's where we are melting. We're going from a solid to a liquid. The melting point is the temperature associated with this. So if we draw a dotted line over, right here is our melting point. It is a temperature that we melt at. So that's the melting point. Now the freezing point is the same. All right, because these graphs we can go either direction on. If we go from a liquid back to a solid, we're freezing. So the melting point should be the same temperature as the freezing point. Uh, boiling point, to do that, we're going to carry a dotted line over from this section. We're returning from a liquid to a gas, that's boiling. So right here is our boiling point. And that's also the same as our condensation point. That's just boiling in reverse, it's condensation or condensing point. Uh, but again, it refers to the temperature, not the part of the graph. So it's just a single number. Um, heat of fusion is this whole section here, is our heat of fusion. How long that flat section is tells us how much heat we needed to put in to break the, um, the bonds to turn a solid into a liquid. Uh, so it's really just the length here in terms of joules is our heat of fusion, and here is our heat of vaporization. Heat of vaporization. All right, where is the kinetic energy increasing? Um, I'm just gonna write off to the side because this is getting kind of full. Kinetic energy is going up in sections one, three, and five. Uh, hence the increase in temperature. Uh, potential energy is what's being increased when we change phase, and that's in sections uh, two and four. All right, and moving on down. Uh, if a substance has a higher specific heat, would the slope be steeper or flatter? The correct answer there is it would be flatter. Think of this as it just takes more heat to change the temperature, so we have to travel further to the right to move up the same amount on a heating curve, so it would be flatter. What makes a solid different from a liquid? Uh, it's rigid bonds. That um, slash like a crystal structure. When a liquid freezes, it, it forms a crystal structure that locks it into that um, solid form. Uh, what makes a liquid different from a gas? So this is um, loose bonds, and most often it's hydrogen bonds. So loose bonds slash hydrogen bonds that still keep everything connected, but they are allowed to move uh, around, and that's why a liquid is different from um, a gas or a solid, is that ability to flow. What state of matter would a gas become if it was heated to a very high temperature? Uh, that becomes a, a state of matter called plasma. 
And what's the change there? It's that all bonds are broken, including uh, in tra molecular bonds. So all bonds are broken and the atoms are by themselves in, in a plasma and they're moving around with a lot of energy. That's why plasma always glows. Our best example of plasma is fire. Um, what is it called when a solid becomes a gas directly? That's uh, another vocab word, sublimation. Sublimation, if a solid becomes a gas directly. Um, specific the specific heat of water is 4.18. What are the units? Describe what that means. So the units, if it's 4.18, are, uh, that's going to be joules per gram per degree Celsius. So 4.8 is the number of joules, so it's like energy needed that you have to input into water to raise one gram of water. So this is like our amount and one degree Celsius. So this is our change in temp. So if I put that into a sentence, I would say it takes 4.18 joules of energy to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius. And that's for liquid water. All right, on to problem number eight. We've got a 500 gram cube of lead and it's heated from 25 degrees Celsius to 75 degrees Celsius. How much energy is required to heat that lead? So this is a clear Q equals MC delta T problem. Uh, we're not going through any phase changes. Uh, it's going to be solid lead on both ends. It's just going to change temperature in uh, 50 degrees. So uh, make sure your mass units match up. That's a spot you can go wrong here. But our mass is 500. So I'll put that in for M. Our specific heat is 0 0.1. To nine, and our change in temperature to go from 25 degrees to 75 degrees is 50 degrees. Uh, just multiply these three numbers. And I get 3,225, what are the units? It is joules, that's how much heat we need to put into the system to cause that temperature change. Or if we went the opposite direction, that's how much heat would be released. All right. Um, here, it's another Q equals MC delta T problem, but we have a different set of starting information. So 25 gram metal balls, we'll put 25 in for M, is heated 200 degrees Celsius, so that's going to be my change in temperature, with 2,330 joules of energy. What's the specific heat? So that's the only thing I'm missing is C. So I'll multiply 25 times 200, 5,000 times C equals 2,330, divide both sides by 5,000, and I'll get my value for C, 2,330 divided by 5,000, 0 0.466. And then the units, we can kind of look up the problem above to guide us, should be joules per gram per degree Celsius. All right. Um, this next one is very similar. You could be maybe thrown off by the fact that it's one kilogram. So you need to just convert that to a thousand grams. And then you're solving for the change in temperature. Uh, let's move on to number 11 though. So um, how much heat is needed to transform 500 grams of ice at negative 20 degrees Celsius into liquid water at 50 degrees Celsius? Uh, for this one, you really should draw a quick little diagram to start. Start with our ice down here at negative 20. It's going to heat up, but it's only gonna heat up to zero degrees before it flattens out for a little while as it undergoes that phase change. Once it becomes liquid water, it'll then be allowed to heat up again to 50. This creates three, whoops, three distinct sections that we need to calculate, section one, section two, section three. Now, when things are heating up, we can just use the Q equals MCAT formula. And then during the phase change, we'll just multiply the mass times the latent heat. So if, as it heats up from negative 20 to zero, 
Uh, we need the specific heat of ice, which is right here. Um, I accidentally labeled this one ice as well. That one's the specific heat of water vapor. Uh, and we can just calculate it directly. Q equals our mass, 500 grams, which would also be 500 milliliters in case I ever gave it to you like that, times the specific heat, times the change in temperature of just that section. It goes from negative 20 to zero, so it changed 20 degrees. All right, for section two, we'll do Q equals M delta H, where delta H is the heat of fusion. And then I'll just do our mass in grams times our heat of fusion. And then our third section, we'll use Q equals MCAT again, but this time the specific heat is the specific heat of water because now it's liquid water. So 500 times specific heat of water, 4,186. That's a good one to memorize times the change in temperature in that section, it changed 50 degrees. All right, let's multiply all of these and see what they add up to. Okay, I just realized I'm getting some really big numbers because my units up here are in kilograms, but I entered this in, in grams. Quickly convert back to kilograms by just converting this to 0.5 instead of 500. That way I'll do it all in kilograms and that's easier than converting the other number into grams. Okay, now let's multiply them all and see what they add up to. All right, so I've uh, multiplied them to find the number of joules for each section, and I would just have to add all three of these numbers up. So let's take a look at those to see if you did it right. And I'm adding them up now. And I get uh, 292,580 joules. Notice it's pretty typical for the heat of vaporization to be more than the specific heat portions. And this is very likely going to be the highest number, whether it's vaporization or fusion. And then the, uh, the Q equals MCAT will be the lower numbers. All right, moving on. All right, uh, we've got another problem about water. Uh, we're going from 30 degrees up to... Uh, 150 degrees. So these will be your three sections. Um, a section from 30 to 100 when water boils, a section from 100 over to 100 as it vaporizes, and then another section up to 150. And you'll have to add up those three sections. All right, but I'm going to move on since that's very similar to the one we just did to number 13. The main span of San Francisco's bridge is 1,224 meters. Uh, it's going to undergo this temperature change. How, uh, how, what is the change in length? So our change in length is equal to the current length times the alpha value times the change in temperature. Just multiply those three numbers and you're going to get the change in length. So our current length is 1,275 meters. The alpha value is 12 times 10 to the negative sixth. And then our change in temperature to go from negative 15 up to 60 or 40 is uh, 55 degrees. Just multiply these three numbers and I will get my answer. And because I entered my length in meters, my answer will be in meters. And I get an answer of 0 0.84 meters. So the engineers of the San Francisco Bridge need to be able to account for you know, nearly a full meter of expansion uh, throughout the year for our Golden Gate Bridge. All right, uh, what is entropy a measurement of? It's a measurement of disorder. So lower numbers would be more ordered, higher numbers would be more disordered. Does entropy naturally decrease or increase over time? It naturally increases, which means that the universe slowly becomes more disordered over time. Give an example of entropy in your daily life. Um, a really basic one would just be your room becoming messy. Room becomes messy. And the main reason for that is there's more ways for it to be to be messy than to be clean. Uh, and it's not going to spontaneously just clean itself through random motions, but it will spontaneously become messy through random motions. All right, I did read the answer to these blanks in class, so I'm going to skip over this. Let's just go look at these pictures and identify the method of heat transfer. 
So number one, a microwave, that is going to be radiation. It uses radiation um, to transfer heat to your food. Uh, the reason it's so effective is that it hits the resonance frequency of water. And we're going to learn all about resonance frequencies in our next unit on sound. Uh, hair dryer, that's going to be a convection. We're heating up the air with the coil, but then we, we're moving the air towards your hair. Uh, and that movement of a hot air or fluid is convection. Uh, scrambled eggs, that's conduction. Anytime things are touching, that's conduction. Um, the handle of a mug becoming hot and then you feeling that, that's also conduction. You could maybe say there's convection within the mug that's heating things up, but the arrow is pointing over here to where conduction would be happening. With fire, it's mostly radiation because we sit next to a fire. Above the fire, you get some convection, but the heat that you feel from a fire is mostly radiation coming straight out to the side. And then uh, a refrigerator, and especially with these arrows, we can tell that it just must be convection since we're moving air, cold air, into the fridge and warming moving warm air out to cause uh, that heat transfer. All right, I'll let you come up with your own examples here. We just saw some examples on the front, but make sure that you come up with your own unique examples. Let's just work on filling in the blank here. You're stirring a bowl of hot soup with a metal spoon. The spoon starts to feel warmer because of, well, so this one I would say is convection. You feeling it is conduction, but the, the spoon is heating up because of convection with the heat moving around the bowl of soup. This one, you know, is kind of convection and conduction. I would say it's kind of both. Because the, the actual transfer into the spoon, that's probably conduction. Heat moving around the bowl, that's convection. I should maybe call that one more conduction. Uh, lava lamp. Uh, is just a great example of convection. Um, uh, a lamp is going to be radiation. Uh, air is warmer at the top of a room because of convection. Warm air rises. Uh, without touching the hot plate, that must be radiation. And then um, you're cooking your marshmallow, but the metal skewer heats up because of conduction. So heat moves along a solid object through conduction the same way it transfers between two subject solid objects through conduction. All right, that's that for this lecture video and have a good rest of your day.